Well, hello and welcome to Boston.com's Cocktail Club. I'm Jackson Cannon, and soon I'll be joined by Gabriel Bastos, bar manager at Atlantico in Boston. It's Cinco de Mayo, so tonight we're making cocktails with tequila, catching up on the local restaurant and bar community, and of course, sharing some tips the pros use to make great drinks at home. When you registered, if you click through to Gordon's Wine and Spirits and purchase the Cazadores Tequila Cocktail Kit, then you have all the ingredients you need. Proceeds from these kits go to Off Their Plate. This is a great charity that buys meals from restaurants that need the business and distributes them to frontline workers and others in need. First, I'm gonna go through everything you need for the chat and all the while, of course, we're taking your questions. All right, ingredients that you're gonna need. Well, you need some tequila. If you bought the kit, you got this great bottle of Cazadores Reposado tequila. And to make the margarita, you're also gonna need to make a little lime juice. If you're juicing ahead, uh, make sure you take off a little bit uh, of a wheel for garnish or a wedge. Um, and you'll need some orange liqueur, Cointreau is preferred. Uh, optional, uh, a little bit of salt for garnish, if that's your thing, we're gonna show you how to do that. Um, and if you're somebody who likes your drinks a little bit well textured or sweeter and you have a little simple syrup, we'll talk about when and how you can use that ingredient. To make the Negroni, of course, besides the tequila, you'll need some Campari, and we've got Martini and Rossi sweet vermouth, um, and you'll need a slice of orange for the garnish. Uh, just using regular cube dice tonight, I'm gonna put a little in my glasses so they catch a chill. I'm gonna use uh, a coupe glass because I feel like having my margarita up, very rare. I usually have it on the rocks. And then I'm gonna use my rocks glass to make my Negroni, even though I'm gonna make it uh, right there in the glass with the ice. Uh, it's still nice if the glass catches a little bit of chill. Other equipment you'll need, something to shake your cocktail with. Uh, we like these two piece cocktail shakers, a little tin on tin or a Boston with glass, if you have that. Of course, if you don't, a little bit of Tupperware, a deli two cup container, something like that can help you. Uh, shake the way you got to go. For the stirred drink, um, a mixing glass and a long spoon, or again, you can do it right in the rocks glass. I'm going to show you how to do it that way if you don't have that equipment. You do need something to measure out your drinks properly. Uh, we use these jiggers in the bar, and these are compound measurements, two over one, three quarters over a half. This really helps us build drinks in rounds and go very fast when we're doing a lot of different things. Um, has the most common measurements that we use. But of course, just remember, that a tablespoon is half an ounce. So if our recipe is calling for an ounce and a half, that's three tablespoons. Two ounces, that's four. So tablespoons, highly accurate, really great way to make drinks. A little slower than uh, you want when you're in the bar busy, but uh, at home, it works just great. Uh, I usually keep some tweezers to move things around a little bit when I don't want to get my hands on them. You're going to need a cutting board and a knife to slice your fruit. Um, if you are doing salt, an extra plate uh, to lay that down so you can get that elegantly on the glass. All right, a couple of questions from registration this week. Rich asked, would it be possible for a future club to focus on mezcal cocktails? Well, I think that's a stunning idea, Rich. Uh, anybody else is into that, please light us up in the chat, let us know because um, we're planning June and we would love to get behind that idea. Got a couple of questions. Heidi wrote that she loves a little fizz in her drinks. And what bubbly mixers would I recommend for tequila cocktails? It's interesting. Dave's question is an answer to Heidi's. He says, how about a recipe for a Paloma? And this is a great drink. Most popular tequila cocktail in Mexico um, based off of grapefruit soda. We're not making that tonight, but if you want to DM me at uh, Instagram or Twitter, my account is at Canon Jacks. Happy to send you my favorite recipe for that drink. Okay. All right, we're ready. Gabriel Bastos was born in San Paulo, Brazil. And as a young man, he was enamored by Formula One racing, uh, more so than by his countrymen's traditional sport, the beautiful game of soccer. Uh, Gabe moved to Boston in 2011 to study organic chemistry. And here he took a less traveled route into the service industry, first writing about the local beer scene for porchdrinking.com, then later covering the local restaurant scene for Eater and Eater Boston. This led to opportunities to meet the local leaders of the restaurant industry, and he became fascinated by them and their lives. Not content just writing about it, Gabe parlayed this access into working his way through an amazing list of local restaurants, Rebelle, Farmstead Table, and Bar Manzana. 
Working with Chef Michael Serpa since 2018, Gabe is now bar manager at Atlantico, a thrilling seafood expression, which draws his inspiration from the simple coastal restaurants of Spain and Portugal. His Venmo information is available in the chat if you wanna get down and support him directly. He is a great bartender and a lover of tequila. Welcome, Gabe. Hi, buddy. How are you? How are you, Jack? I'm doing, I'm doing great, man. It's good to see you. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Um, so, hey, tell us a little bit about Atlantico. Tell us about the restaurant and the drinks that we can find when we come visit you there. So, seafood from Spain and Portugal, that's like the shortest way to go about it. Uh, you know, chefs, Michael's Food has always had Spanish influences and Select is obviously a very seafood driven restaurant, you know, it's mostly an oyster bar and fish. So Atlantico is a little bit more casual, a little bit smaller plates, a little bit more cocktail and nightlife focused than Select. But the two are so very similar in terms of flavor profile. Surface food is what it is. It's always beautiful. It's always elegant. It's always light. Uh, so all of those things inform the bar program I put together for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll never want my cocktails to try to outshine his food in any way. And from a presentation perspective or from even a palate perspective, like I didn't want to do anything that was like too heavy, too boozy. You know, you're not going to be able to taste the variations between oysters or crudo if you like just like mostly booze or like a lot of age or a lot of alcohol. So that makes sense. So I'm guessing a, uh, some good vermouth cocktails and maybe a few with some sparkling wines and things like that. And, you know, between Spain and Portugal, you have vermouth, you have sherry, you have port, you have Madeira, you have all these fortified wines. And like my trick with that bar has been like, hmm. Which classic cocktail can I incorporate one of these things into? Well, that's awesome. Hey, what's uh, been the, I'm, I won't ask you to pick a favorite because I know everybody hates that, you know, uh, but let's, uh, let's ask what's been the most popular cocktail at the bar recently? The most popular cocktail has actually been a tequila cocktail uh, by far. So I, I came up with this little idea that I wanted to name all the cocktails after beaches in the Atlantic. Because I, I like thematic nomenclature. I think that makes, I have a hard time coming up with cocktail names that I don't create. So I, I think some sort of organization helps me that. It's good, good to have a system. Right. Uh, and I always like, want to make sure that the name sort of makes sense and is an introduction to what that cocktail is. Like we have a Cadiz cobbler cocktail that's made of sherry. Uh, but the most popular is called the Tulum, and I knew it was going to be kind of popular, so I chose a popular beach that everyone knows and likes. Mm -hmm. So that's silver tequila that I infuse with orange bell peppers for a couple of days. So like just to, not to make it spicy, but to punch up that vegetal flavor you get from tequila. And then a little pineapple, a little lime, and Aperol, and so on. But that sounds like all delicious and just the kind of drink that's a little bit tough to kind of produce one at a time at home, right? So you're all set up to do the infusion. Um, so I think people who, uh, after they're done with this, if they're ready to head, head out, uh, Atlantico should be their next stop. Um, this talk's making me thirsty. Should we make a cocktail? Let's hit it. So the plan is to make a, 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 a according to Hoyle version of the margarita, the original version. And it's it's funny because I did a Tommy's recently and I've done so many spicy Tommy's and stuff over this year. And it, it's, it's just, that drink is so powerful and so wonderful. I kind of forgot how delicate and beautiful and wonderful the original of this drink is. Um, so we're going to take everybody through that. Uh, but there's a couple different things. You can do this up or on the rocks. I'm going up. I think Gabe's going on the rocks today. Um, you need to shake this drink properly. However, you're, Putting it in the glass, even if you're putting it on ice, you got to shake this thing up right. Um, I'm going to do a version that's two ounces of tequila and three quarters each of lime and the orange liqueur. You can pull that tequila back a little bit if you want to be in those classic two one one proportions, but I actually think with a great tequila like this, um, just a little bit more is actually going to help. So I'm going a full two ounces. Now, um, another thing, if you're going two one one and you're looking for a little more sweetness, you can always drop just an eighth of an ounce or a quarter ounce of simple syrup into a classic drink like this that's using a liqueur as the sweetener. And you'll pick up texture before you pick up sweetness. So 
Um, that's just something to keep in mind. But today I'm going two ounces of this Cazadores Reposado. Uh, it smells just terrific. Three quarters of an ounce of Cointreau. This is a triple sec orange liqueur, probably the, the great high standard. Um, and one that a lot of the classic drinks like this are built on. And then of course, I've got some fresh squeezed lime juice. I squeeze this just a little bit uh, ahead of time. I like, um, I like when my lime juice kind of sits just for a couple of minutes at least. Um, this has been about uh, 25 minutes. Um, and I did the juice of two limes so that I have a little bit for the next, uh, for my next margarita after we're done. All right, I'm just gonna put that to the side for a second. And I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna slice a lime wheel um, just by taking the end off here. And I think Gabe, you're going on the rocks. So you're doing a, you've done a wedge. I'm going to do a wheel Ross here. Salt margarita. And I actually was going to ask you some other question. How do you feel about agave syrup in your margaritas? Well, that's that Tommy's version I was talking about, and I love it. And again, as that split the difference, right? That beast that's both a Tommy's and an original. You use the tiny few drops of agave nectar to texturize the drink before it sweetens. It's a great idea. Um, I've got my my uh, glass nice and cold here. Don't need to, but uh, putting a little notch in my lime wheel, I can treat the side just with a little bit of that lime juice. And then I'm using some kosher salt. Just gonna pour that in a plate. And then what I'm gonna do is sort of a trick that in the restaurants, um, I mean, when you're making it at home, you know whether you want salt or not, right? So you can cover that whole rim, but a lot of times when we don't know for certain, and we've asked, but you can never be sure, you just do sort of a little half rim. Half rim is the way to go. You know, and it lets you manage your intake. You sort of, you get a, a sip with some salt, and then a little later you can slide over to the side. Because yeah, I like a little salt every couple sips here and there. I don't want every sip to be salt, for sure. Right. All right, so I've got my glass all prepared. I'm ready to shake. How about you, my friend? Shake it. All righty. And this one, I am going to be, you know, really trying to throw the ice back and forth in the shaker, give it a good mix. You want to get this good and cold, all the ingredients mixed together, a little bit of dilution. You also want to get the kind of uh, aeration, that action of the air bubbles that are getting sapped in the citrus. And as they push their way out, it's going to make a very pleasant drink for set. And again, questions coming in on the chat about, hey, how much of that sugar should I put in there? Start small. Like start with a tiny little eighth of an ounce. Um, and then from there, you know, if it's up to the desired effect, you may have to, uh, you may have to try it a couple of times to figure out exactly where you want that to be. But that's the kind of fun thing about making them at home. Ooh. Yeah, like quarter ounce, eighth of an ounce, bar spoon. Alrighty. Well, I'm getting excited, Gabe. Cheers to you, buddy. Cheers, guys. Mm, that's delicious. You know, I gotta say, it's it's different than that high impact texture of the Tommy's, but I love this drink. It's ah. lean and. Oh. I mean, you know, I made one with your specs a couple of days ago, just like re-familiarized, but it had been years since I had a margarita with this recipe. I was like, it works. It's well, so yeah. So the the funny thing about that extra half ounce of tequila, it actually adds texture to the drink too. Oh, for sure. So you know? Was that a tequila? For sure. Mm -hmm. um, and this is fun. So we're getting a question about the styles of tequila. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly uh, a couple of things, because a lot of people are saying, hey, without trying every tequila out there, how do I know to get a good one? Always get something that's 100% agave. That's the plant that tequila is made from. And it'll say right on the bottle here, it's etched or on the label, 100% agave. You've got to do that. And then that kind of discounts. You don't have to worry about that whole gold category or any of the other stuff. You're in 100% agave. You're dealing with three basic versions of the same thing. If it's rested up to two months, 
bottled off as Blanco, sometimes called silver. Those are the fresh, ripe, lush, um, you know, vegetal, young, you know, really great, bright tequilas, good for cocktails. Reposado, anything over that two months up to a year, um, it picks up a little bit of color, picks up a little bit of wood, but still has a lot of that fruit. Añejo is past that year, up to two years. Um, starts to get woodier, more of a sipper, a little less likely for cocktails. Um, and that's pretty much it. And the reason that's all so fast and not like in Scotland where you might have 30 years to age your whiskey is because um, this is happening in Mexico. You have pretty wide temperature swings per day in a low humidity environment. So all of the things that the barrel does, it does quickly. Um, all right. So, hey, we've got... Um, the generous support of Cazadores sponsoring us tonight. And that brings us global brand ambassador for Tequila Cazadores, uh, Manuel Inosa, coming to us live in New Orleans of all places, because this is an American Mexican holiday after all. And Manny's gonna tell us a little bit about tequila and what he's up to tonight to celebrate this great holiday. Hello, Manuel. Hey guys, how are you? Manny Inosa, global brand ambassador for Tequila Cazadores. Happy to you know to be there with you, especially this day. There is a big celebration in the United States. All over the country celebrate. Uh, we celebrate the Battle of Puebla in Mexico. We celebrate it's a Tequila Day. So I'm visiting a lot of Mexican restaurants, and today I'm at Johnny Sanchez, one of my friends, Aaron Sanchez, restaurants here in the city of New Orleans. And uh, you know, uh, I love the recipes. I love the margaritas, guys. They look tasty. I'm enjoying one too, in a little cazadores cup. And it's pretty much the same recipe, tequila cazador reposado, fresh lime juice. And I use two ounces. I like my margaritas with two ounces. So quick, uh, we make tequila cazadores in Arandas, Jalisco, in Mexico, one of the five states they can produce tequila in Mexico. We have 32 states and only can, five can produce tequila. Most of the tequila, about 95% of the production comes from the state of Jalisco, and we made our tequila in the highlands of the state in a, in a town called Arandas. And uh, we're, in, next year, we're gonna be celebrating 100 years of making magic with tequila cazadores. We are, uh, tequila that was made for the Mexican people and after so many years cross the borders and we have it in a lot of different countries around the world. We made a Cazadores Blanco, we made Reposado, that's the one you guys have right there. We have an Añejo, we have an Extra Añejo and we have a Cristalino Tequila. Quick on how we make it, we only use agaves, mature agaves from the highlands of the state uh, of Jalisco, only from the region, around the region of the distillery. And uh, we harvest the agave when it's seven years old. We do the uh, fermentation, the slow fermentation, seven days. And after that, we do the double distillation. And after the double distillation, we finish with tequila Cazadores Blanco or Reposado, two months to one year in brand new barrels from Kentucky uh, because we make a tequila that tastes like tequila. We don't want to highlight any notes from bourbon whiskey uh, or cognac like any other, you know, some other companies, they like to use recycled barrels, brand new barrels from Kentucky and uh, only used for tequila cazadores, or añejo one year to three years, or extra añejo three years and up, and the new baby of the family, or cristalino that is a añejo. And after that, we do a slow charcoal filtration, and that's how we make, uh, how we finish with a beautiful, tasty tequila. Well, Manny, thank you so much for that. Cool, I just wanna show you guys something fun. I'm outside Johnny Sanchez, and it's a cool event going on. Like I say, it's Cinco de Mayo, and I wanna show you what's going on here. People enjoying the party. Say hello. Everybody, hello. And having margaritas, look at the mural. Hello, 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 hello. And that is Johnny Sanchez, guys. And it's uh, an event with Tequila Cazadores. I got invited. Well, thank you so very, very much, Manny. Hopefully next year we can party with you in person. Come over to New Orleans. You never, the party never stops here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Cheers. Well, he looks like he's having more fun than us.
For sure. It's not true. Not true. Yeah, I love that. I love that place. I'm love that guy. He's. Uh, I had the very good fortune to visit uh, his home in Mexico City, and boy, he is just like he sounds on there. He is knowledgeable and caring and high energy and just a ton of fun. So that was great to get a view into their brand vis-a-vis -vis Manny. Um, I'm still sipping on my margarita, but we probably should spin another cocktail. Um, although they're asking us for the recipe for the Tulum. So is that something you give out at the restaurant? Yeah, absolutely. I give out everything. Uh, nothing, nothing's a secret. Uh, it's just going to take a little, little time. So the first step is make the pepper tequila. So orange bell peppers. I think, yeah, I think give them the ratios just so that they know what they are at K-State, you know? Yeah. Um, orange bell pepper, I'm very specific about that one. It's the only one. It, it's a color thing. It's a flavor thing. Like, don't do yellow. Don't do green. Like, I don't know. I'm almost sounds like you tried it. Sounds like you tried them all. I, I before we opened up Tontico, I, I went through like a month of my life where it was just like infusions hell. I was just like doing infusing all kinds of spirits with all kinds of weird stuff that shouldn't maybe be in spirits. Just wanted to see how it was going to play out. Orange is what you want. And then I make like a pineapple syrup with fresh pineapple juice and a little demerara. And then I make a lime cordial because the idea before the word started going back into normal. The idea for the bar at Tondico is for a lot of cocktails to come out of the draft system. So I originally formulated all of this to come out of a draft system and I would just add the carbonation at the end. So pull all of these ingredients and then just add soda pretty much. Uh, cocktail took off, the bar took off, we moved away from the draft idea, but that cocktail became so popular that was just like, I'm just gonna leave this recipe as is. So everything is meant sort of to be stable under pressure on a draft system. So it's a pineapple syrup, it's a lime cordial, and the lime cordial is not my recipe at all. Uh, if you guys wanna learn how to make a great lime cordial, Jeffrey Morgan Thaler, that's the man, that's the recipe you wanna follow. So it's one and a half ounces of tequila, three quarter ounces of your pineapple, it's half ounce of apro and quarter ounce of your lime cordial. Throw it up and you're good to go. Sounds easy when you say it. I'm definitely coming in. Definitely coming in for one of those pretty soon. In the meantime, I feel like maybe we should do something, do a little something a little more bitter, something a little stirred. I would love something bitter and stirred. We take us through a tequila Negroni. Yeah, absolutely. So many, many variants of Negronis. Uh, some of them have their own name, you know, an old pal, a boulevardier. These are all Negronis at their heart. Uh, a tequila Negroni is sometimes known as a Rosita. So we're just going to start with a pretty standard Negroni bill. Uh, equal parts, everything. Equal parts are tequila, sweet vermouth, and the bitter ingredient, which in this case is Campari. So I always like starting with the cheapest ingredient first when I'm building my cocktail. So let's crack open that sweet vermouth. The other thing I always like mentioning when I'm touching sweet vermouth is after you open, it's a good practice to put a date on the back of here because that's not gonna last forever. And then after you're done using it tonight, put it in the fridge. It shouldn't leave at room temperature. So one ounce of this guy. Words to live by, Gabe. Vermouth in the fridge, right? Always and always buy the smallest bottle they will sell. Even like very high volume bars are really not going through so much vermouth that they need a huge bottle all the time because you, you want that to be fresh. It's it's pretty much still wine, it's fortified, but you want that to be fresh. Then one ounce of Campari. Now you're make you're making it in the proper mixing glass. I wanted to show everybody at home. I'm doing this right in my rocks glass, but I'm still building it as if I was going to pour it from one to the other. Um, I don't want the ice to be like faster or slower than I want it to be. So all of these ingredients sitting there for a moment while we're talking, while we're getting ready, I'm going to stir it, the ice right into it and serve it uh, kind of Tegroni style. <laughs> um, but uh, 
you know, it's uh, you can do it either way, but it's still good to build your drinks and then add the ice after. That way, that dilution is what you're is more under your control. Are you doing a? Are you you're going? To, oh, that's a pretty. Tell us about that bit of ice in your glass, Gabe. Oh, on this glass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, got it as a present. Beautiful spheres. Uh, anything that sort of boosts forward like this that I don't want to add dilution at the end because you know in this case we're adding all dilution in the stirring process and I'm gonna take that out of the ice. And then I kind of want to maintain it where it is. I want to find the biggest rock possible to slow down the dilution and to just stay cold and thick because I, I think a Negroni should have a little bit of body. I think that's one of the many things I like in that drink. So I'm going to pour over a big ice sphere. Uh, and these are just silicone molds. You can buy them anywhere. You can buy any cocktail stuff. In. Some of them are easier to use than others. This one. Pretty easy. It makes nice spheres. While well, Gabe has been moving along in his preparation, friends, I've been cutting an orange, taking the top off, cutting it in half, creating a, a little half moon. Because um, on this drink in the rock on the rocks, I'm gonna like to slip this this semi-cut piece of orange right in the glass. On the occasions that we're enjoying this drink up, the tendency is to use that orange twist instead. Um, but on the ice it's uh it's nice to float the whole piece in there you get the twist and a little bit of the fruit soaking in so gabe i see your beautiful long spoon look what i'm going to use tonight instead chopsticks sure whatever works a little bit of chopsticks as you can see i have a little bit of a fascination with some bar tools i i can never have <laughs> power spoons or swizzle sticks like when anytime anyone asks me like, what should I get you as a gift as a bartending? It's like, these are my two favorite things. Everything else, I'm like, uh, whatever. I like spoons. Uh, I like my swizzle sticks. So what the, the thing that you can see in common between Gabe and I that uh, in our different platings here is the ice is moving around almost like one body in the glass, right? Um, we're not chopping at it. We're not smashing it around. We're being really careful to kind of twirl it in such a way that it melts, incorporates the ingredients chills everything down but doesn't get too roughed up in the process oh for those folks who do have certain pictures like this at home the other thing i was like mention is we went through a lot of effort into building this cocktail in a way that preserves texture so be careful when you pour it into the glass this is not the time you want to incorporate a lot of oxygen a lot of air you want that nice laminar flow coming out of your stirring pitcher so it doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, of air or oxygen. That's just going to make it more satisfying and more thick body. Mm -hmm. Then for my twist, I always try like going a little bit across. I never go like straight up and down. I like going across. I think that looks nicer, especially when you roll it up. And I like big long twists as well. Friends, notice he's doing that twist right over the glass. So that ze the zest uh -oh. that comes off in the twisting process is also going towards the drink. And then the last little bit about twists is can you put them in any sort of way. The way I like thinking about placing a twist is I always want Whenever I'm drinking it, I always want to be able to smell this part, which is the part that has all the nice oils. So I'm just going to layer it right like this. So when I go to drink it over here, that's where my mouth is. If I could trade you, I, if I could trade you right now, I would. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Mm. That's very nice. That is an amazing, amazing cocktail. It's really stunning how very similar to the gin version is, and yet, you know, or, or the Boulevardier, the bourbon version, and yet it's really got its own thing going. The uh, sure. agave plays on the notes in the Campari in a completely different way. It's exactly that. I think it interacts with the Campari more than any of the other spirits you mentioned. And I wonder if there's like something about 
salinity or minerality that plays with the bitterness of the Campari really well. Well, and it, it pulls everything more towards like say blood orange than the grapefruit notes I get, a high tone grapefruit I get out of the gin version. Um, you know, and part of that's the, you know, the flavor profile of the tequila versus the botanicals infused into the gin. Um, you know, I, I am thrilled to be drinking this with Reposado. I think most of the time I've done it with Blanco, which yeah. is maybe closer to the gin version, a little bit more rambunctious and vegetal and, and, and fruity, but with Reposado, I, this to me becomes a, a little bit more of a regardable cocktail. What's, um, so tell people who are asking about the difference between say uh, the Negroni and then the tequila Negroni and the Rosita, the slightly more complex version. Can you tell people about that drink? So you're going from a standard built like what we just did from one ounce, one ounce, one ounce. And then you can start playing around with variations of what you use for your vermouth base. So you can split your vermouth into sweet and dry vermouth, and you can dial in the proportions a little bit as well. So a lot of people will do one and a half tequila, three quarter, three quarter down ingredients. Other people will do two ounces of tequila, quarter ounce of each vermouth, half ounce of Campari, you can, that's how you split the, your vermouth base fairly easy without having to do a lot of complex measuring and complex math. Um, a lot of people like then swapping out Campari with different bitter ingredients. That's a nice take as well. You don't need to stick with Campari. There's great Negroni variations. I use things like Aperol, for instance. Well, it's yeah, so interesting, right? If you keep the template and then start moving around, like, yeah. you know, the first, the the, the, the old uh, Mr. Potato Head, I think, as the, the bar at um, Death and Company used to talk about. First, you know, you can move the bases through, but then these secondary and third ingredients you move them through. And I think it's interesting because I have drank a lot of martini, uh, all, their, all their lines, but I hadn't made uh, this cocktail with the martini and Rossi. And I actually think that's part of like what I'm kind mm -hmm. of vibing on too. It's a uh, uh, that um, there's a this kind of beautiful oregano note that mm -hmm. I don't get out of even, you know, some other uh, vermouths I might choose for a different application, you know, like. For the most part, we use Lustau because that's them more thematically appropriate for a lot of the other mm -hmm. things too. Um, and that's delicious, but that's a lot lighter. And what, what I'm noticing is just exactly what you're saying, just a lot more like savory notes, a lot more body, just a lot more complexity in, in, in the martini. Well, it's, you know, the good things are simple things done right. And it's been just a pleasure making these drinks with you, Gabe. True, Jackson. It's, you know, this is incredible. I, I've been well, sitting that... in the bar since before I knew how to bartend. And to be able to do this is pretty special. Well, it's been a treat to have you. And that is all the time we have this week for Cocktail Club. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Join us again next week at our regular day, Thursdays, uh, at our regular time, 7 p.m. We've got Joe Pops McGurk, the mayor oh of Cambridge. God, that's going to be so uh, fun. Right? He's going to be here, and we're making drinks with Grey Goose Vodka. <clears throat> be sure to follow the link on our sign-up page to Gordon's Wine and Spirits to pick up the Boston.com Grey Goose Vodka Cocktail Kit. <clears throat> You'll be supporting off their plate and getting everything you need for next week's Boston.com Cocktail Club. Thanks to Cazadores and Manny. Thank you, Gabe, so very much. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much.